Welcome everyone to another session of Dress and Drinks. Um, I'm Leon Weavers. I'm a professor of costume design at Loyola Marymount University um, and an active member of the Costume Society of America. The Costume Society wants to thank you all for joining us today on Dress and Drinks in our series Conversations on Dress. And with that, I would like to welcome uh, to, the, to the show Elizabeth Semelhack as the director and senior curator of the Bata Shoe Museum in Toronto. Uh, Elizabeth feels that footwear and, and its production are linked to so many things from science and technology to gender politics and social inequities. Uh, and she wants to remind us to stop overlooking what is arguably the most essential component of our wardrobe. Uh, Samuel Heck's robust background at the Bata Shoe Museum alone is a direct reflection of the enormity of what shoes have to teach us. She is currently uh, pardon me, she has curated exhibitions on depression era footwear, sneaker culture, men in heels, and shoes and politics, to name only a few. Currently, she is working on an exhibit entitled uh, uh, Exhibit A, Investigating Crime and Footwear. She speaks to the media almost daily about shoes, um, the endless primary research, and discovers something new in footwear every day. Prior to Bata, she studied painting, printmaking, and Japanese literature at Bennington, and then went on to do a terminal MA in Western art history at Tufts and Japanese language at Cornell. While working on a, on a PhD in Japanese art history, Semelhak was focused on ukiyo-e and the intersections of gender, fashion, pop culture, and economics. Uh, so with that, I would like to welcome Elizabeth Semelhack to Dress and Drinks. Please join us. Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's great to have you here. I'm super excited about this I am and too. to chat really? with you. Yeah. Thanks so much. So. Um, so go ahead and let's dive right in because I'm sure you have some amazing, beautiful shoes to show us. I've got a lot. I wanted to start with a pair of Canadian shoes. So these are from uh, Eaton's, which is, which was sort of the premier um, uh, department store in Canada. And they're from the 20s. And, you know, I think they sort of speak for themselves. They feel like a little bit of an Adidas collab <laughs> with those three stripes. <laughs> <laughs> they're quite stunning. I mean, they are they're, they're really stunning. I love them. <laughs> so, okay, I'm going to take you through a little bit of who we are <clears throat> and what we do. So, the museum was founded by Mrs. Sonia Bata. Here she is in 1966. Actually, this was the Bata uh, Shoe Company's world headquarters in a building that she helped design. She loved architecture and she really was somebody who wanted to participate. Uh, she was, even though she had married into the Bata family, which even at this point, uh, immediately after the war in 46, was still one of the largest shoe manufacturers in the world. Uh, she was not somebody to sit uh, on the Riviera and enjoy cocktails. She wanted to travel with her husband and she made a very, astute observation early on as she was traveling around the world because Bata had factories all around the world was that people's feet are basically the same no matter where you go around the world but what they put on them is remarkably different so she began collecting and wow. <laughs> and so this is this wow. what our current um uh collection looks like we now have close to 15,000 artifacts. She of course started with one in 1946 uh, when she bought a pair of Maasai sandals. Uh, and she did send researchers to all the circumpolar countries in the world um, when she moved to Canada, a little bit, a couple decades after she moved to Canada. But we have the largest circumpolar footwear collection. Uh, we have a very strong collection of Western fashion, but that is not, was not her principal focus. She was very interested in footwear truly from around the world. Um, this is part of the... Uh, oh my God, that's amazing. So it really is quite a remarkable collection. And so she was collecting and she was collecting and then finally some people 
put the bug in her ear that really maybe what she needed to do was to open a museum. So when she started to think about this in all seriousness in the 90s, uh, she chose one of Canada's most prominent architects, Raymond Moriyama, and he was inspired by the idea of a shoebox with its lid slightly askew, because shoeboxes contain shoes, but once you open a shoebox, you get to see everything that's inside. And so he designed for her a, a, a gem of a museum. That was actually his um, charge that, that she gave him. And it is truly spectacular to be able to work in a building designed for our collection. So Mrs. Bata liked to see what it was that she collected. So as you saw, we have all open storage. Eventually, if we are, uh, continue to collect at the rate that we're collecting, we're gonna have to go to compact storage. But um, we have temperature and humidity controls, everything is fiber optics, and the building has four exhibition spaces. One is a permanent exhibition space where we change the artifacts, but not the thesis. And then we have three temporary galleries which we change each one every 18 months. So that means we do two new exhibitions a year. And what I love about them, and you'll see, they're basically blank boxes that we can um, do up in any way that we wish to try to get the story across, the curatorial narrative across. So this is the building um, as it was built, and it stands in downtown Toronto at the corner of St. George and Bloor, right at the edge of the Toronto uh, University of Toronto campus. It's easily accessible, and that also makes it a joy. It's easy for um, both Torontonians and tourists to get to. So here I am in storage. Ray, and this is a great photo. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, I like this photo because you can see just how jam packed it is. But as you said in my bio that I was studying Japanese art history. I have a, a terminal master's in Western art history, but my focus was really on Japan. And um, I came to hear about the job in a kind of ridiculous way. My mom, who was an international intellectual properties lawyer, um, happened to have an office in Toronto and an office in Buffalo. I grew up outside of Buffalo. And one day, one evening in 1999, she went to, the, to some women's event at the Battashee Museum and Mrs. Bata spoke to the crowd. And she called me that night. I was at the St. Louis Art Museum at the time. And she said, I have found the perfect place for you to work. And I was like, mom, I do Japanese art history. I do 18th century Japanese prints. What are you talking about? And she's like, I'm just telling you, this is perfect. And so just by complete and utter coincidence, about three months after she told me this, the job of curator was posted and it was actually really interesting. So I, put together a serious application in part to tell my mom, listen, I'm listening to you. And the next thing I knew, I was being flown up to meet Mrs. Bata and she hired me. So I have now been at the museum since 2000. So it's going on 23 years this August. And at first I wasn't sure how long I was gonna last, how many questions of shoes I could have. And certainly it was all unfamiliar territory, but of course I'm still here and I still have a million questions. So when I first arrived, I found some things I was comfortable with, such as this pair of Oidan Geta. I knew exactly what they were. I knew how they were worn. Fine, okay, I had one thing I understood. <laughs> and then I started looking around at others and I wasn't so, so sure. So these are a pair of uh, Myanmar uh, royal slippers in the shape of the Hintha bird, which is a <clears throat> Theravadan Buddhist symbol. And they are spectacular. They're from the 19th century. Those this are, is a, oh my God. <laughs> these are a pair of uh, Ottoman Nalin. And so Nalin actually, uh, sometimes they're called cab cabs. They, the, their structure actually dates back to ancient Rome because uh, the ancient Romans invented heated bathhouses and the floors were really hot. And so ancient Romans wore stilted wooden shoes and everywhere Romans went, their bathhouses went. 
and the bathhouse culture within the Mechrab and into the Ottoman Empire became very important culturally. And so one of the traditions was for brides to do a bridal bath. And so they would be gifted a very fabulous wedding nolin. And so this is the bride's nolin. They actually have her initials in them. And this is her with her hammam bowl. But you can already see, I think, incredible structural differences, material differences in the footwear in just the three pairs I'm sh I've shown so far. This oh is a... <laughs> this is happens to be one of Mrs. Bata's favorites. Um, they're Dutch clogs, and I find them almost surreal because one, you typically put on shoes to cover your feet and to put on shoes that completely conceal the foot and yet are carved in the shape of a, a naked foot is kind of odd. But the really unnerving part of this pair is, um, can you see my cursor? Yes. So it's almost as though the skin of the foot has been <laughs> stitched into this material here. It's all of course carved, but they are a wild pair. Um, oh my God, like Scaparelli and Dolly. Yes, I know, exactly, shoes. exactly, very. They're, they're Dolly before Dolly. Um, this is a pair of Indian Paduka from the end of the 18th century. So uh, what's beautiful about them, obviously, is their sculptural quality, the way they literally pair together and create both positive and negative space the incredible ivory scroll work and then the way that these are worn is uh you put your big toe on, on and uh, you, you grab the toe knob with your big toe and your second toe and they are stilted because they are designed to be in keeping with buddhist jain and hindu concepts of not hurting any sentient life and so one of the risks that we have when we take steps is that we can step on bugs and, and small creatures. And so this at least minimizes our literal impact on the earth uh, through how they are designed. They're one of the oldest forms of footwear from India. Is that inlaid? That's amazing. That scroll work is so, I mean, breathtaking. It's just gorgeous. And slightly ironic because they are made out of ivory. Yeah. Yeah, next. Okay. Um, so uh, this is a pair of relatively contemporary. From, they're from the 80s. They're Moroccan, um, Balga, or also called Babouche. Uh, I think that their sculptural quality, you know, seen from this way, is really quite beautiful. And one of the hallmarks of Babouche is that the shoes are made um, completely as full shoes but the backs of the shoes are always pressed down. This pair actually is um, glued in place. And so I think it is in relation to uh, the, 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 the need within Islam to pray five times a day. And so it becomes a kind of alteration to clothing that reflects piety, um, that you care less about your shoes than you do your practice. <clears throat> and the ease of putting them on and off. Right, but the ease of putting them on and off could easily have been done if you just made it a mule. So why go to the added step of making it a full shoe True. back True. pressed down? So the back pressed down must have some deeper meaning or, or more meaning. Uh, we also have the largest moccasin collection in the world. This particular pair is from the 18th century, right around the time of the American Revolution, it's Haudenosaunee, most likely Mohawk. Um, it's decorated with quill work and it has deer hair tassels. It is such an incredible pair of moccasins. And I do, however, want to stress that while uh, Mrs. Vada did collect all these pieces, we know that the world is changing. The world is changing about the belongings that are held in museum collections. And we as a museum are, are in agreement with UNDRIP uh, and we are in agreement that indigenous people need to have the voice for how their belongings are presented. And so we are uh, moving forward only uh, 
with working with indigenous scholars. And so um, it's, it is an incredible collection, but it's, I think what's really exciting about this moment is that so many, many more voices are by necessity going to be added into uh, museum conversations. So as I had mentioned, uh, Mrs. Bata did send researchers to all the circumpolar countries. Of course, the first country she chose was Canada. And so uh, she had the researchers go up and work with women who were Inuit women who were still making footwear in the traditional manner. But she also held a competition where she put out a call for people to make traditional footwear using all the traditional uh, materials, processes. And so this happened to be a piece that was submitted to that competition. Lee Okadaluk um, won, won in her category. And I want to also point out that this pair is made of seal skin and it looks like the seal skin might be dyed or bleach so that it creates that polar bear shape but instead those are two different pieces of seal skin that are inlaid together. And one of the things that's so impressive about Inuit seamstresses work is that they're able to make the nap of the two different skins uh, sort of lie seamlessly so that you believe that you're really looking at one piece of skin. It's incredible, especially when you think about the fine work around the, the arms, the paws, incredible work. That's incredible. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and so, so the researchers went to to the Canadian Arctic, Alaska, Greenland, Inuit, um, Eastern Siberia, West Western Siberia, and across Sami, which is where the Sami live. And so, this happens to be a pair of uh, Inuit <clears throat> Greenlandic Inuit uh, boots. And you can again see how different they are from the, uh, the boots that I just showed you from Canada. What's really incredible about these is, is, of course, Greenland was colonized by the Danish. And you see a lot of influence of Danish design. But up at the top here, it looks almost like needlework or needlepoint. But instead, what all of this colorful stuff is are the most microscopic slices of dyed or painted seal skin that are stitched in place. And so this incredible design is so laborious. And today, a number of um, Greenlandic uh, people are using the, are being inspired by um, this, this work and having tattoos made of it. Um, it's a really, vibrant uh, sort of discussion that's happening in Greenland right now between traditional dress and or, uh, and tattooing. <clears throat> wow, that is amazing. That I mean, those are such stunning boots. That red is so beautiful. I know, they are incredible. And in real what life- What is the, what is the, is it, I'm assuming it's leather, but what kind of leather of the, yes. oh, seal skin, wow. Yeah. And the other thing too, when you actually work with objects is you can really sense their materiality and seal skin is thick. The amount of effort to work with these materials is really itself so impressive and hard to convey through a simple um, image. Yeah. So as I was starting in my job and I'm looking at all of these shoes and having these exact same reactions of, oh my gosh, I had no idea. This is incredible, this is incredible. I had a really, what I thought was a very simple, innocent question, which was why the high heel? <laughs> Little did I know that this, no serious academic work had ever been done on the history of the high heel. And in the early 2000s, this was when a lot of discussion was happening about high heels as women's power tools. The concept of erotic currency was being played with. And there were even reports that women were biologically predetermined to love shoes. When I would go to parties and people would find out where I'd work, they would say things like, oh, you must work in a museum for ladies. And it drove me insane. Um, this is ultimately actually one of the reasons I, sh I 
began working on sneakers because I was like, have you guys never heard of a sneaker head? But um, when I started to ask the question, really, why this? You know, shoes, you think, have a pretty important job to do, which is to protect your foot and help you gain mobility, go from one place to the other. And the high heel is so counterintuitive. It also, particularly in the early 2000s, was so strictly female. And so I really wanted to start figuring this out. And the answer actually lay in a different artifact in the museum, which is, this is a Persian riding boot from the 17th century. And so as I was starting to trace the history of the high heel, it was taking me further and further and further away from Europe into Western Asia. And so I could see hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of illuminated manuscripts, of uh, miniature paintings that depicted men in heeled footwear, riding horses, doing military work. And so the heel, I have argued, um, I've dated it, I've traced it as far back as 10th century Persia, but I assuredly it dates back further. I believe that it was invented uh, to be worn with the stirrup. This is why cowboys still wear high heels today. We just have not been schooled to think of them as high heel wearers. And that it was through world, uh, the, de the destabilization of um, trade that began to happen as Spain and Portugal got on ships and began to um, go into the world that uh, some European countries became very interested in Persia and so eventually, when Persia had this amazing Shah, Shah Abbas I, and England in particular was very interested in having trade relations with Persia, that all of a sudden, European, Northern European men began to have heels added to their riding boots. So it was a form of exoticism that entered into Europe and men were the first to wear it. In fact, I think you can see the comparison between these two images. There's a lot in common that's going on, but of course, I'm most interested in what's happening at their feet. So as my research was sort of showing that the heel had nothing to do with principal constructs of femininity, it just was a thing that has been used in different places and different times to signal different things. Of course, I had to also try to figure out why in the world did women come to wear heels? And so it turns out that at the turn of the 17th century, there was this moment in women's fashion where upper class women began to borrow from the male wardrobe. They began to do things like wear men's hats. They um, carried swords. I was reading this document, this book, which is from 1620, um, late at night, and it was complaining that women had stilettos. <laughs> of course, it meant that they had little knives, but it was pretty funny to read late at night about that. Um, here, she's got a pistol, you can see, and she's being contrasted. And spurs, and she's wearing yeah. spurs. And she's the one wearing heels because she's trying to masculinize her appearance by adding heeled riding boots to what she's wearing. And she is being compared to a womanly man who is in flats. Because at this time, heels were for men and flats were for women. And so it's, I mean, it's not, by the 1620s, some women were wearing heels, but it is such the unexpected history, right? And I knew at that point that shoes were really going to lead me down some very, very interesting paths and that I was going to learn things that I had to go in down this path with a completely open mind and see where the evidence took me. And so um, I just compare this detail from the, the Manish woman with this is an image from Rubens de Medici cycle and you can see this early heel and how it's replicated in this more rough woodcut. So of course, over the course of the 17th century, uh, enlightenment concepts are starting to brew. There's this huge gender divide that's being established. One of the most remarkable things that happens is that the depiction of men and women changes radically. At the beginning of the century, men and women are almost basically the same height. And by the end of the century, 
men are much bigger and women are smaller. Cinderella is written by Perot in 1695, I think it is, might be 97. And all of a sudden, idealized femininity by the end of the century is about appearing as small as possible. And this is what heels did for women. They were a tool that took the bulk of the foot and hid it up under women's skirts. And the placement of the heel had in part something to do with stability, but it also truncated the footprint so that you have this teeny tiny little bit of a, of a toe sticking out from under your gown or your dress. And then you had this truncated, shortened footprint that you left behind. And all of this is to meet the social ideals of a diminutive foot. There was absolutely no interest in long legs on women at this time. That has to wait until the 20th century. Fascinating. So, um, and of course, every shoe I'm showing you is from our collection. <laughs> there are a few that aren't, and I will highlight them, but everything so far is. So as I was walking down this road, thinking about elevating footwear, I also came across the Chopin. There were some very sort of silly statements that had been put out about Chopin's, that one, Chopin is what led to the development of the heel, not true. Um, two, that Chopin's were worn by women in Venice to elevate their dresses above the, the dirt and the muck, 100% not true. And so I kept looking for evidence of those things that I had read and kept finding, finding counter evidence. So we happen to have a few Chopin's in our collection, but they are all really complicated. <laughs> so the red Chopin that you see here is a Chopin in our collection that is remarkably similar to the pair of Chopin's that are in the career. I mean, um, it's the paintings at the career, Carpaccio's painting of two Venetian women. Also, Chopin's had for a long time in fashion history been linked to the footwear of prostitutes to the point that this painting was called a depiction of two courtesans, when in fact they are two noble women because the top part of the painting, it had been cut in half at some point, which is now in the Getty. It's been reunited. They know the family that the, these two women belong to and that what this really is, is an image of a young bride. And brides got, the first time a girl got her Chopin's was at betrothal or at her wedding. And so the Chopin's in this painting, I think are about the fact, or there to reinforce the fact that she's a bride. But we know that Chopin's, well, so Chopin's were worn in Venice. They were worn in many other places, but let's just deal with Venice for a second. So people are looking and looking and looking. They, no images of Chopin's, no images of Chopin's. I'm looking at an image of a woman wearing Chopin's. And the way that I can tell it is how monstrously tall she is compared to her ballet instructor. And in fact, this is an image, this is from the Met, it's not in our collection. This is an image of a young bride. She's got her hair down, she's wearing her pearl necklace. And the reason that she has to be talking to her ball ball uh, ballet instructor is that she has just started wearing Chopin's, which is what's making her so tall. And she must learn how to walk and sit without ever showing her Chopin's. So then of course, I have to have the question, what's the point of that? Um, and so my research, and also I could find actual research to prove that Chopin's were worn kind of like a foundation garment. Mm -hmm. uh, you lift her skirts and you see these Chopin's. But the real reason that Chopin's were worn in Venice is that Venice was the center of east-west textile trade and itself was a principal um, center of textile trade. And when uh, quote unquote new world exploration started and suddenly other countries could get textiles from the east without going through Venice. It caused a huge amount of financial disruption in Venice to the point that at the end of the 16th century, they could only marry one daughter per generation. And Venetian men had to wear kind of simple clothing because it was a republic. So the only opportunity to convey um, familial wealth was through the dressing of women. 
and women were generally sequestered and they were let out on view at certain times of the year and for certain things such as weddings. And so having longer and longer and longer skirts using more and more and more textile became a form of expressing how wealthy a family was and it and the increasingly high heights of Chopin's was a part of trying to make this statement of wealth. Oh, that's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> and then, you have just like blown up all theories about Chopin's so in five minutes. <laughs> this is in fact an image of a prostitute or a prostituted person. Um, but the reason why she's wearing Chopin's is that because so few women could be married, the state and the church were terrified that men would turn to sodomy. And so they actually decided to oh, sanction. Terrible thought. I know. So they actually decided to sanction the quote unquote honest courtesan who could dress, who could be dressed like a bride. And so the women who could then be kept by men of means, the men also kept these women and used the way they kept these women to show their own wealth. So it's all very complicated and much more complicated than I could talk about in five seconds. But anyway, shall That's I- That's fantastic. That is fantastic. And I love this image. Like, the, I know, the, it's so funny. The, Skirts up. <laughs> this drawing, it's like, woo, the wind blew my skirt up. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like this could be a great pop-up card. Yeah, you know, the Met owns it. They should make it um, as something you can take away. Um, so I think some of the confusion about Chopin's comes from the fact that the way they were worn in Venice was very, very different than the way that they were worn in Spain or the Iberian Peninsula. And the reasons, but the reasons were the same. So in Venice, women weren't allowed outside very often. And when they were put out on view, this was an opportunity to show the glory of their family's wealth through how they were dressed. Spanish women, both Muslim and Catholic, when they went out, they covered themselves completely in black cloth which meant that the glory of their clothing could not be seen. So they had their skirts end at the top of their Chopin's and their Chopin's were encrusted with jewels and incredible. So here you can see the two different types of Chopin's, the Spanish Chopin, uh, which is like a block, and then the Venetian Chopin, which is much more narrow and plain and white and almost like underwear in its color, its use of lace. So I'm starting to see these these changes, these divisions. And then that brought me to our Chopin, our Chopin's. Um, I decided that I wanted to have all, I did an exhibition on Chopin's. I decided to weigh them and have them x-rayed with the help of our incredible team. And so wood construction is a hallmark of Italian Chopin's. So our Chopin's are Italian, but they share the lacing structure of Spanish Chopin's which Venetian Chopin's don't have at all. So now the goose I'm chasing is trying to figure out regional difference in Chopin's in the Italian peninsula and considering when the Spanish took over parts of the, uh, the Italian peninsula. The sack of Rome, their importance in Milan. You think about uh, Eleanor de Toledo and her marrying into uh, the Florentine de' Medici family. So who knows if I'll figure it out, but it's actually really quite exciting for me. That is fantastic. And um, I love those two, that two pair. One of them looked like it was velvet and the other looked like cooled leather. Is that true? Correct. So ours is velvet. So this is ours and it's velvet and it's wood, but it has these holes up here, which is in the lacing tradition of the Spanish ones. Spanish yeah. ones, have four, um, f four uh, eyelet holes or rows for eyelets. I mean, rows, eyelet, four eyelet rows. <laughs> I can get this out. And then they would lace it in a way that this does not portray um, because it's just somebody contemporary put this horrible lace in. But they would use silk laces and they'd lace it all in fancy ways and the laces would become tassels and they were all about visual display. And so I'm now trying to figure out what, why are there so many Italian Chopin's with Spanish 
um, elements and could it be Spanish influence in different parts of the Italian peninsula? Wow. And this is what the exhibition on a pedestal, uh, broke he Renaissance Chopin's to Baroque Heels look like. It had, a, it had uh, two more rooms, but you can see we borrowed from the Carrere in, in Venice, uh, some of the tallest Chopin's in existence. And behind it, it is very, I know it's a little hard to see, but is the tallest Chopin in existence, which is 22 inches in height. Wow. And of course, because they can't be stopped, um, I am now <laughs> reconsidering Manchu platforms um, because the Qing dynasty was obsessed with all things European, particularly Italian and Portuguese. And it was during the Qing dynasty that Manchu women began to wear these platform footwear. Um, one of the words for Chopin in Italian is zoccoli, which means horse hoof, and a Chinese word for this type of footwear is matze, which means horse hoof. And so I'm going down a road to see if maybe the European Chopin was a form of Occidentalism that helped to create the fashion in the Qing dynasty. Oh my gosh. Okay, now we come to this. This is one of the rare shoes in our collection. And it's incredible. It is an early rubber overshoe. So what's amazing about it is that rubber, which is the sap of a tree, had been used by indigenous people for centuries, but Europeans struggled with thinking that it was any of any interest because when they took the sap it, and you know, took it to France or, or the United States or England, it would coagulate and it would sort of become crumbly. And this is why we call rubber rubber today because it was used to rub away pencil marks. That was like the only thing they could think of to use for it because no one could figure out a way to reconstitute it. And there were some enterprising uh, people who decided that they were going to have overshoes, rubber overshoes made in Brazil. They employed 12-year-old um, girls who cut their fingernails in a certain way so that they could do the floral design on the front. And then they sent these, they were sort of semi-cured, sent them to places like Boston, and it, it created a literal rubber craze. These rubber overshoes cost five times the pair of good leather shoes. So this was new technology. This was exciting new material. But in the winter, they cracked, and in the summer, they melted, and it drove um, inventors such as Charles Goodyear crazy. He wanted to figure it out. And he found out that if he boiled latex, rubber, and added sulfur, he could stabilize rubber. And that, of course, led to the invention of sneakers. So when the sneaker was invented in the middle of the uh, 19th century, it was invented in relation to the new industrial class. Uh, I mean, the new industrialists uh, who were part of the Industrial Revolution. They were the nouveau riche who wanted to show that they had arrived. And the best way to show that you have arrived is to show that you have leisure time. And so they began to, they revived the ancient game of tennis. They built these massive tennis courts, which were on dewy, expensive grass. And so the rubber canvas tennis shoe was something that one, was a flex, it was expensive. Two, it helped to, help to keep the player's feet dry. And it also prevented damage to the lawn. So the early sneakers actually start out as this huge expression of status. Interesting to think about where sneakers are today. It's basically that they've come full circle. And mm -hmm. this year in the collection is the first year that Keds did the champion in 1916. Wow, that's amazing. But that is amazing. Yeah, they are incredible. And Mrs. Bata had them in the collection, but she hadn't been focused on sneaker collecting. And so I said to her in 2011, I asked if I could do a sneaker exhibition. As I mentioned, I was so tired of hearing this idea that shoes were just for women. And so I decided to turn my attention to sneaker culture and constructions of masculinity. And we have slowly been building our sneaker collection a uh, relatively recent acquisition is this pair of 1985 Air Jordan 1s. Well, we now call them 1s, but the first Air Jordan. And what I love about Air Jordans is that nobody knew that this was going to be a thing. And what Jordan, I mean, what Nike did, which was so remarkable, was that the Air Jordan 2 
looks nothing like the Air Jordan 1. So it became a yearly thing, almost like fashion collections. Like it came out each season, something new. But the first Air Jordans are all worn because nobody thought to collect them. Nobody thought to preserve them because they figured it'd be like a Stan Smith. It's gonna come out again every year. So I did an exhibition called Out of the Box, The Rise of Sneaker Culture. And um, because we didn't have any sneakers, we had to borrow from 38 separate lenders. Um, Suzanne Peterson, who's our collections manager, she can attest to what a complicated and challenging exhibition this was, but it also traveled. It went to the Brooklyn Museum. They dropped the first part of the title, just called it The Rise of Sneaker Culture, and it traveled across the US and 550,000 people saw it. And it was a turning point in my research. That's amazing. We have all of these pullovers from when Roger Vivier was designing shoes for the House of Dior, as well as original drawings. So we did an exhibition and worked with the Met to unite drawings, shoes, and, and um, pullovers. Uh, I did an exhibition in 2014 with Allison Matthews David called Fashion Victims. Uh, these Pinay boots are beautiful. He was an early manufacturer, but he also employed 700 women to work in uh, less than ideal conditions doing piecework and doing these incredible um, botanically accurate designs. Uh, shoemaking itself, this is another artifact in the collection. Um, it's an automaton that is meant to, uh, it was a, from a series of automatons showing things that were disappearing. So shoemaking as it was being industrialized was disappearing. So we did an exhibition called Fashion Victims that looked at um, the perils, pleasures and perils of dress in the 19th century, including how uh, beauty, uh, how fa the fashionable were kept um, bright and clean. You know, you had to show up in polished boots, uh, but of course that meant that there were boot polishers who were not living the high life. Um, we have incredible 30s material, but we also have a lot of worn out 30s materials. This is when I did the exhibition Want. I thought the term want spoke to both need in want of something and want being desire. Fashion magazines told women in the 30s that they needed to have a pair of gold shoes. And I thought at first that that was kind of rude <laughs> at the height of the depression to have gold shoes. But what they meant was that women, if you, they had a pair of gold shoes, gold shoes went with everything. So it was actually a cost saving measure. And this is what want looked like. I wanted it to look like a bank. <laughs> Um, I also wanted to talk about some of the challenges that women face as they went to work. They always had to wear stockings. This is a Dorothea Lange image of a stenographer as she's desperately tried to sew her stockings because stockings cost 10 to 20 percent of what a woman were, what a woman earned weekly. Wow. That. So fashion and its impact, right, was huge. It also was a period of great innovation. Um, we happen to have this incredible set of Jan Torney shoes. We just acquired a Jan Torney trunk. He was a shoemaker in the teens who said he was the most expensive shoemaker in the world. And we feature him as well as uh, Beth Levine in an ex exhibit called Obsessed that explains how we have become such a shoe obsessed culture. And also currently up is an exhibition uh, that I did called Future Now, virtual sneakers to cutting edge kicks. And I asked the question of what's happening to uh, with footwear in the metaverse. So this is a pair of virtual sneakers. Um, they were then forged in real life. You can see them here. So Future Now asks uh, questions about sustainability, about inclusivity, and about the metaverse. And then the most recent exhibition, which we just opened a few weeks ago, is on flowers and footwear. I love this pair because the flowers actually snap off and leave the snap which maybe suggests to me that you could you could substitute in another flower. Yeah. Um, and also we wanted to feature indigenous floral work um, in this exhibition. So we worked with three indigenous scholars. This pair happens to be Wendat. And this is what that exhibition looks like. It looks at both flowers as motif, as well as plants as a material for the making of shoes. And there you have it. Wow, that was amazing. Like that was a whirlwind through footwear. I love it. This is awesome. And and to think we have 15,000, right? You know, we have works on paper and buckles and stockings. And what I love about how Mrs. Bata collected or what she was willing to collect is that if it was even tangentially related to footwear, we could have it.
And so it makes my life a joy because storage is just chock full of stories and, and, and new ways of entering into cultural questions. That's fantastic. And so how active uh, was Mrs. Bata in the, in, in, you know, or is in the whole organization of the museum and, and what you were curating and things of that nature. That's really fascinating that you as a curator were like, here's the person who founded the museum. This, and this is her collection. You know, it's like, it's like talking with them, um, uh, you know, the, the, um, oh, I'm thinking about the mu the house museum in Boston. That's my, one of my favorite places. The, um, oh, yeah, the Isabella Stewart Gardner. Yes. Yeah. It's like, having a chat with the steward like with well, Isabel Gardner and being like hey so we're gonna put some stuff out what do you think and so um you know she she was passionate she passed away in 2018 she was opinionated uh but sh so she and I could tussle but we were always tussling about what we thought was best for the museum and she was open to letting me try different things, to explore and upend um, sort of traditional ways of seeing things. And so she she, she was strong-willed. Um, and I like to describe her as sublime in the real meaning of that word, which is awe-inspiring, terrifying, um, amazing. Uh, and so she really, you know, how many people make a shoe museum? Very few. And the and the one that she made, I think, has allowed us to continue. I mean, she's left us uh, prepared and she's she collected up until the very bitter end and we are continuing to, look, to collect. So I'm very grateful. Okay, we have a couple of questions, but I have a question for you before we dive into those. Okay. Tell me about the virtual tennis shoe. Like, how okay. did you do that? I'm super interested in that, and I might have to have a conversation with you offline about that. So give give us a you know give me a give me a little snippet into the virtual tennis shoe. So I I have seen I started to see that that well one I did an exhibition on dolls and I asked the question was the dressing of avatars in virtual games or on online games a form of doll play? I think it is. And I saw that a lot of men were spending a great deal of time. And in fact, in a lot of games, you can spend a lot of time going to a store and picking out which sneaker you're gonna wear. And I'm like, okay, okay, that's really interesting. So sneakers are being rendered within the gaming space. And then when NFTs started, I was like, oh my goodness, now we have virtual sneakers that people are collecting, but they can also wear them like in Decentraland or Sandbox on their avatar. And so without going on too long, one of the things I always say whenever I lecture on fashion is that fashion is anything but frivolous. Canada, where I live, was founded on fashion because people got in, men got in boats and came across to this country looking for beaver pelts, not beaver steaks, not beaver oil to cure some disease, but beaver fur to make men's hats. And so as the metaverse was being created, I began to see the same impulse that people are going into the metaverse and they're bringing with them many of the structures of the real world. But at the same time, there's some interesting possibilities because in the metaverse, there's no obligation that shoes have to protect you or do anything. So in the exhibition, I also have footwear for the, vir the actual virtual world. So when you put on your headset and go into VR, and I think it could be really interesting because you could do away with gender. You could do away with um, one of the people who I highlight, Antonio Hernandez. He works with the concept of shoes made out of water in the virtual world. So it's a super exciting moment to be thinking about that. And I'm happy to talk more about that to you anytime. Cool. Okay. So we have a few questions. So first of all, from uh, Candy, what percentage of your collection is corrective or medically necessary footwear? We, it's, it, I don't know if I can give you the percentage. It is small, but we do have uh, quite a few pieces. Um, and so, yeah, uh, we do have examples um, and we have historic examples. Um, as well as slightly more contemporary examples as well. 
Cool, awesome. Um, another question from Summer um, and a comment. I really hope to visit the Bata one day. I'm yeah. wondering if there are any plans to make an accessible online collection of the museum's holdings. So that is something that we are talking about. One of the things that um, <clears throat> people need to understand about us is that we are very, very tiny staff. We are only 12 people. Um, and so we, we, I think, punch above our weight, but it does take a lot of time to build an online searchable collection. So as I mentioned, my colleague Suzanne Peterson is here and she has been digitizing our entire collection. And so that work is being coming to completion, uh, which is incredible. And so we will hopefully be able to make sure that the collection is searchable. I do think that's really important. I, I rely on that when I go into other collections, but if you, before we get there, you can also go online and look at um, online exhibitions. And so you're able to see some of our holdings that way. Fantastic. Um, and here is uh, another question uh, for you from Karen. I did a project on Manchu shoes in my graduate studies at FIT. I read yep. that the Manchu shoe inspired the creation of the Italian Chopines. No. Do you agree? Question mark. Um, no. And uh, I thought you said the reverse. And then she said, it Susan, with some images, gorgeous exhibition designs, especially the floral one. So some and the great reason why I say that there's no way that it could, that the Manchu platform could have inspired the um, European Chopin is that the actual um, use of the platform shoe goes way, way back to ancient Greece. There is an unbroken use of platform footwear and women's attire from ancient Greece up to the Renaissance. Cool, um, awesome. Are there any other questions uh, that you have for uh, for our guests? If so, put them in the chat. Um, so tell me, what is your favorite shoe or shoes in the museum? So, because you may have only one. <laughs> and I don't, um, but I was thinking about this. And let me see. I, I do like this pair of Terry de Havilland's because they speak to both of my principal interests, which is the high heel and athleisure uh, sneakers. Um, they're just so funny. And I love the, the way that the zipper is around here, the zipper motif. Um, they're so disco. They just encapsulate a, a number of my interests in one single shoe. Okay, so, and now I have a question. I have another question. Give me your take on heeled tennis shoes. So heel tennis. <laughs> well, they're really they're really old. So when the first tennis shoes were made in the 19th century, they were flat for both men and women, but within very short order, they started to be made with heels for women. And then um, in the 19 teens and 20s, many, many women's tennis shoes came with heels because we begin to have discomfort with female athleticism. And so heels in part try to mitigate that. It's like, I'm playing tennis, but I'm still a girl. Um, and so I think they're really complicated. And I think that that happened again with the wedge heeled sneaker, which was basically so many women were banging on the door of sneaker culture saying, let us in, we want the shoes the guys get. And manufacturers were keeping them out because they weren't offering the most desirable shoes within sneaker culture in women's sizes. And so what they were given as an alternative was this feminized wedge heel version that was sort of like, you can sort of dance on the periphery of um, secret culture without being fully embraced. Oh, that's really interesting. Like that yeah. is a fascinating thing to, you know, because um, as Ebony points out in the, th uh, in the chat, in the nineties, heeled tennis shoes were everything. So, I know. So, so that is another yet moment of fashion repeating itself um, yeah. and wrapping itself around. Um, one last question again from Karen. So, and I, you mentioned this in it. So you think that the, do you think the Manchu developed their platform shoes on their own or influenced by other Eastern or Western cultures? Well, the reason why I want to walk down this road to see whether or not the Manchu platform was inspired by a European model is that the Qing dynasty 
was famous for loving European things. They collected European painting. They brought European painters. They liked clockworks. They, and so it wasn't like they weren't already fascinated by Occidentalism. So, and given that it was the Italians and the Portuguese that are, and the Spanish that are sort of over there, it would make sense to me that the Chopin would have shown up. So one of the things I'm doing is I'm tracing the Chopin to Asia. So for example, in Goa, which was, uh, you know, it's part of India, but it was a Portuguese outpost. Um, this was a place where Portuguese so soldiers went and um, the king had what was called the daughters of the, of, uh, the daughters of the king. And the daughters of the king were daughters who were left behind by soldiers who had died in service of the king. And so one of the king's obligations was that he had to provide these, these orphan girls, these fatherless girls with their dowries. And dowries in both Portugal and Spain and Italy included Chopin's. So Chopin's go with these girls and they end up in Goa and they start to take on their own personality and they change. So I believe that the Chopin and concepts about Chopin's are moving eastward. And so I would not be surprised if it was uh, a form of Occidentalism within the Manchu court. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was super fun and wonderful and delightful. And it has just been a pleasure. So um, thank you. With that, once again, uh, it has come time to end uh, this session of Dress and Drinks. Please follow the Costume Society of America on Facebook and Instagram to make sure that you hear about all of our upcoming episodes of Conversation on Dress. Lastly, if you enjoyed today's content, we implore you to make a small or large donation to Costume Society to keep this content free for all. Uh, we even accept checks. So, um, so please drop that in uh, or visit our website. Um, thank you again so much. It has been such a great pleasure to chat with you. Thank um, you. And we'll talk with you soon. Okay, sounds good. Bye.